you have a good studio, you have a great sales process, you truly care about your members, people that say they can't afford it yet have all the other stuff because their friend justified it, you can reprogram them to be able to justify this expense. Now I'll tell you what I mean. In this episode of the GSD Show, a GSD Show talk, we dive into GSDCon. We're actually presented on stage in front of over 300 fitness studio owners on how to advertise like a giant with a Goliath budget. Want to get inside access to the ad campaigns that have been used by some of the most successful fitness studio brands from all over the world? The ads they've used, the landing pages, texts, emails, videos, what their prospect journey looks like? All of that is available now in LRVT, which stands for Loud Rumor Virtual Training. Whether you're a rookie in the advertising game or a seasoned professional, LRVT is designed to help you and your team advertise like the best fitness studios on the planet. Each training is well produced, thorough, and based on proven campaigns that we've ran successfully over and over again. You'll also be a member of our community where you can ask questions and get support from our team as well as the many other studio owners that we work with. To get started, go to loudrumorvt.com. Again, that's loudrumorvt.com. Apex Websites helps fitness studios put their online lead generation on autopilot. How do they do this? By offering websites that are optimized for mobile and beautifully designed, featuring a customer-centric copy that aligns your fitness studio as a solution that helps your customers overcome their obstacles. Included are automation features such as email follow-ups, SMS notification, and local SEO tools you can use to measure your website performance. Go to GSD with Apex to view an online demo and find out how over 500 studios and martial arts schools are generating daily leads using the Apex platform. All right. So first, I'd like to start with we are all programmed. What I'm about to dive into is some really, really cool stuff. And this is something that I never thought about until like the last like year. And then I got so into it and I started studying it. And there's like real like biology as to why we do what we do. So let me give you an example of little things of how we're programmed. And then it's important to know this because once you know this, then you're able to market to people and advertise to people and also change your own behavior in a way to where you can advertise and market and sell in a way where you're gonna get more out of it because you're not falling into the trap of the programming that we all are. Every single person in this room is programmed. Your thoughts, the way you think or even feel about certain things has been programmed into you. And everybody that's thinking, not me, that's programming, that instinct thought. Now I'll tell you what I mean. <laughs> little things. We'll start small, and then we'll go a little bigger. Deal? How many of you guys have been in a conversation with someone, and you don't really know what to say, like, the person's not really a good conversationalist, you got to say something. And so you say something like, and raise your hands if you've either been guilty of this, or somebody's done this to you. You just go with the classic icebreaker of, oh, man, I'm exhausted. Mm. That's it. That's, that's it. Or, oh, I'm beat, I'm tired. And you say that, why? Because you know the other person is going to give you their program response of, oh, so am I. And then you start justifying why I barely slept last night, or I worked all day, I'd wake up early. Could you agree that that stuff's true? How many of you guys would raise your hands if, like, that's programming, you know what happens? Like, why are we even talking about it? Why would that be the icebreaker? Just because you know it's been programming, you do it. Here's another one. What are we going to say to her in about two seconds? God bless you. I'll say it before she even does it sometimes. Bless you. Why? The plague's over. Why are we blessing this person? The plague's over. Ask where it came from. There's two, theor two other theories as to where it came from, but the most reasonable one is there was a plague, and the most common symptom of the plague that you had it was that you start sneezing. And so people would start blessing that person, hoping you don't die. Meanwhile, today, we continue to say it. Somebody can crack their head on the floor, and we'll go, Damn, you, you okay, man? That guy needs the blessing. She's fine. Would you agree? I don't even like, and, and it's weird because I told my wife, I'm going to stop saying God bless you when they sneeze. That's weird. And she's like, no, 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 it's going to be rude. And I'm like, think about that. That's great. Like, why? Anyway, moving on. How about this face you, you make when you pass someone? Why is this the thing? Who was the first guy that did this and it caught on? Like, like the, the, what the, f 
And the funny thing is, in Jersey, when I was in high school, it was the exact opposite. It was this. How did it go from here to tight lip? Loose lip up, tight lip down. And then what do we do back? When someone does that to us, what do we do back? And I, and I feel trapped. I do. I just did it. I wrote this presentation. Then I went to the gym. And I said, and in my head, I'm like, as I wrote the presentation, I'm never doing that again. I'm never making that dumb face again. And then I go to the gym and some guy caught me. He goes like this. And I go, I'm like, ah, I got me. Why? Push the button. Programming. Okay, moving on. This guy walks by. Hey, how are you doing? Good, and you? What if she answered? What if she was like, you know what? Actually, things are really tough. I got these two kids that are driving. And you're like, look, you're breaking the rule right now. We're supposed to keep just good. How are you? Move on. I don't have time for this shit. But we ask this open-ended question be safely because we know the program response. Like, this guy knows this is going to happen, and she knows she's going to go, good, how are you? And that's it. She could be having the worst day of her life. She's going to say that. You get to the department store. What's the guy say? Hey, can I help you find anything? And what's everyone say? Ah, just looking. Ten minutes later, hey, I'm sorry. Do you have the, you could have saved ten minutes. Just ask that earlier. We're programmed because what did our parents always say? No, I'm just looking, and we watch, we go, okay, good, yeah, I don't want to get caught in that trap either. There's no reason. I ask. As soon as somebody comes up to me, I say, yes, I'm looking for this, this, this. This is my biggest pet peeve in the world. I hate forgetting my keys at a place. Hate it. Because I know I'm going to get the terrible joke that you can't prevent saying if someone forgets their keys at your place. This guy comes over and goes, oh, it's not going to get far without those. Yeah, I know. You're a 15,000 person that said it to me and everyone else in the world. And anyway, I hate it and I know it and it's programmed. This guy was programmed and I'm programmed to know it's coming and hate it. Okay, so how does it change our perspective, this programming of people without reason? When I was a kid, I didn't like cops. I had no reason to not like cops. I just grew up in a really rough part of New Jersey and in that part of New Jersey, you just didn't like cops. Like, remember in Old Park? You grew up in Old Park. Like, we didn't, why? They didn't mess with us, Carmelo. They were fine. I never got messed with. But I would see a cop and I'm already like, this guy want. And then same thing with this guy. Like now my dad, my dad was a self-employed man. So I never heard like stories of, oh, my boss is this, my boss is that. But I did have 22 jobs before I was 24 years old. And I worked with a lot of people that would be like, oh, my boss is such an asshole. My and I look at and he's not really not that bad of a guy. He just asked her to do something. But they're describing, like, in people's worlds, they look like this guy. I've never met this guy in real life. I've had 24 jobs. This guy does not exist in a management position. Would you agree? Not to that extent. But we see him that way. Okay, now how has programming been used in marketing? I'm going to show you some cool stuff now. Okay, the Got Milk. This Got Milk ad took off in the 90s. They decided, you know what, we're going to sell the hell out of milk. This just makes sense. And so they created all this stuff, and they put celebrities, and they put athletes, and it was, does the body good? And they started creating a ton of ads. And when you A-B test, you can create a lot of videos. I think sometimes we create too many types of videos as opposed to one type of video in many different ways. Um, so this was the first, I'm sorry, the second Got Milk ad. And uh, I didn't do the first one because it was a little longer. Uh, but I did this one, and I thought this was just as good. But watch what they do, and all of them do the same thing. They want to change your perspective of milk and what milk is for you. Drink your milk, kids. I don't want milk. Milk's for babies. <laughs> yeah, babies. Well, yeah? Well, I happen to know that milk helps build strong bones. So drink up. Well, Mr. Miller told me he never drinks milk. Look at him. Yeah. Right, kid. Well, that's not good. <laughs> there were like 76 commercials that ended silly like that, that end with gut milk. Right? Do you guys remember those? And you know, there was more milk sold in the 90s versus the 80s. It was like a, it was like 2400% increase or some crazy number. Go and research. I can't remember the number now. I wish I did. I should have put on the thing. But it was like in the thousands of percent increase um, just by doing this kind of stuff. 
This is another one. Now, my dad, self-employed, but he's in the jewelry business. In fact, so was my grandfather, my uncles, some cousins. I, I kind of like ended the track <laughs> not being in the jewelry business. But I learned that like diamonds are not really rare at all. In fact, they used to be until they found this huge mine and then all of a sudden like they had tons of them and now it wasn't that valuable anymore because it's all about supply and demand. So they have to find a way to make it more valuable. So they bought all the supply, De Beers Company bought all the supply and then they limited how much they gave out. In reality, a diamond isn't really worth much at all. And in fact, you have a 50% cut in, in uh, value as soon as you buy it and walk out of the store. But they said, you know what? We have to find a way to be able to sell these things because we have a lot. <laughs> so how do we sell them? And how much do we have? We've got enough to sell half the population. Okay, well that's women. So how do we get diamonds to half the population? And so they started creating ads. And before like 1940, diamonds weren't the stone. For, like if you were, Kim, if you were like born in 1925, you may have gotten like just a band or you may have gotten like a ruby, you may have gotten something else. Now, you're married now, I saw, I know you're married. What kind, of, what kind of stone is that? Diamond. Yeah, you and my wife have at least that in common for sure. <laughs> but how, ladies, raise your hand if you have a diamond ring. And if you're not married, raise your hands if you'd want a diamond ring if you were going to get married. Yeah, it's expected. And guys, you would be nervous going, I'm going to propose without a diamond ring. You'd feel like you'd have to feel her out first to make sure that's cool because you don't want to get rejected. So in reality, they changed the game by saying a diamond lasts forever. Now what's more interesting than that is they put out several different ads about how that is. Printed ads, video ads, and then to top it off, they realized that people were buying diamonds, but they were buying like the minimal smallest diamond just to say they got a diamond in there and they could do the thing. So now they had to get people to buy diamonds in higher value. So they said, you should, like they wrote articles, the, how much should you spend on a diamond for your fiance? One month salary. And immediately that happened, it was too easy. So he said, let's see if we can do two months salary. And they did, and sales went up. And I'm gonna show you the first time that they announced two months salary and how they did it. How else could, could two months salary last forever? You made that face like that's crazy, but that type of ad is why you have a diamond on your finger. That, right? Because without that, that, they changed the game. You might have had something totally different. So you make that, but that is the reason you have a diamond on your finger, which is interesting, right? They changed the game. Coffee, coffee was not that type of a drink. Where like, who drank at least one cup of coffee today? How about two cups? Three? Damn, it hasn't been that boring, dude, has it? No, but you, you got, you, this wasn't like that. They said, we have to find a way to make it so that people want to drink it throughout the day. And so they created ads around coffee break, coffee break, and this is what they did. Now they wanted to make sure that they sold their brand. And so they created, remember I told you guys, the best companies don't want to create like new stuff all the time. They create different varieties of the same thing. Right, Alex Hermosi, he's gonna be here speaking tomorrow. I mean, a lot of his ads look almost exactly the same. There's just different varieties of that ad. So you keep hearing the same message in different ways, right? It's really good. Billie Jean kind of does the same thing. So I'm gonna show you, this video I'm gonna show you is a compilation that was 14 minutes long. I only kept like the first 20 seconds because I wouldn't do that to you. But it's actually funny, it's just not the platform for it. So let's start with it. Okay, buddy, what do you think of Wilkins coffee? I never tasted it. Now what do you think of Wilkins? Care for a cup of Wilkins coffee? No, I don't like coffee. This has been a public joke. <laughs> We're here to persuade people to drink more Wilkins coffee. What's the club for? To get their attention. You getting on the Wilkins coffee bandwagon? Never. No! You either go with Wilkins or you just don't go. <laughs> If you don't drink Wilkins coffee, you're not all there. Oh, that's a lot of... In 
fact, without Lucas Coffee, you're nowhere. <laughs> so, I, as corny as they are, like, I, I watched all 14 minutes. I couldn't take it. It was a big time suck, but I enjoyed it all. But you see what they do, like, they keep creating different varieties, and what happens is people start talking. Mac and PC did the same thing. Remember those commercials? Where people would be like, oh, did you see that one, or did you see this one? And they had all different ones, and they wanted to see them all, and so you kind of start watching. And so I thought it was pretty interesting. Here's another one. Oh, this coffee is criminal. Honey, you killed a petunia. Then you admit it. Your coffee really is murder. Papa Eddie, my coffee, it's murder. It's either too bitter or too weak. Try Folgers. Because Folgers coffee is mountain grown. Mountain grown? Like the sign says. Mountain grown for richer flavor. You know it's a crime not to have delicious coffee like this all the time. We will now that I've discovered the mountains. <laughs> Folgers coffee. Mountain grown for richer flavor. What the hell does mountain grown even mean? Why are why is that a thing? But the funny thing is they had a series of video ads where it always ended with mountain grown. And that's the reason. Oh, it starts with, every ad starts with the husband completely disrespectfully insulting his wife. His wife wanting to go make something of herself with this coffee game that she doesn't have. And then she finds the guy. And then she comes, he, he like tastes it, likes it. And then she explains mountain. And it's like the same video, just different scenarios over and over and over. Okay. So I tell you this because Two reasons. One, I'm not saying I want all of you guys to go out there and become ads men and say, okay, how do I do this for myself? That's not even the thing. That's not even it. If you guys want to do that, great. But what I will tell you is, out of everyone in this room, um, I bet maybe 15% of you are probably going, what could I do? How could I do it? How could I do it? And then maybe 10% are going to say, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. And then maybe 1% or 2% are actually going to be really, really successful with it. And most of the rooms either not going to do it or they're not going to do it right. Or they're not going to be consistent with it. The reason I tell you this is, again, not because I want you to be ads men, but because I want you to wonder if your programming is actually getting in the way of the decisions that you make. Right? Phrase like this, I can't afford it. Now, the people that have said that in your studio and the times that you've said that to others, how many times has that person said that, but they have a $1,000 phone in their hand? Or you know they've got flat screens on their wall. I know people in my family that say they can't afford things, and they've got like seven flat screens in their house with all the shit. It's just value, right? Or the car that's more expensive than the car that they need, and the difference in the car that they need and the car that they have could give them the things that they said they couldn't afford that would actually help them in their life. Right? Like, people, are, would you agree most people drive a car that's probably more than what they need? And not to say you shouldn't have a nice car, but then if you have a nice car and then you say you can't afford something that's actually good for you, then why? Right? Or they have the Apple Watch. I've had this thing. It's useless. It really is. I, I've been saying I'm going to get rid of it for like a year, and I just haven't. I don't know why. I keep wearing, I'll probably wear it next to GSDCon too. But it's just, it doesn't do anything that I need, really. Maybe my heart rate, but honestly, like, whatever. Here's why. Their friends spend money on this stuff, therefore it's justified. That's what's created the programming. When you hang around people that are spending money on watches, and flat screens and all those other things that actually don't improve their lives and live in the same world where they say they can't afford things that actually make them healthier or make them wealthier or make them have a better relationship with their family, right? That you've justified. You can make those decisions and be at peace with yourself because my friends have flat screens, my friends have cars, my friends have this, and my friends can't afford all those things either. My friends can, so when they say, Oh, did you hear that gym membership's $150? Who would pay that? Yeah, 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 I know. Who would pay? And then that's your programming. You get programmed in. But here's the thing. You start hanging around with people that have different programming, you can get reprogrammed, which is really cool. Or people that say, I don't have the time. Right? I've been hearing I don't have the time since I was born. Right? But yet, at the same time, Netflix, this is crazy. It's a crazy stat. Actually, I'm going to ask. How many hours do you think the average person spends watching Netflix per week? Average. 
10 hours a week. That's a work week a month. 10 hours a week is the average. You can get that from Netflix. That's not, that's not my, I didn't just make that up. That's 10 hours a week. There's the source right there. 10 hours a week. Now, I want you to think about this. At 10 hours a week, people that say, I don't have the time to work out, right? So anybody that gives you that objection, I don't have the time to work out. If I want you to work out three times a week, you still have time to watch seven one-hour series a week. The problem is they can say, I don't have the time to work out because their friends also don't have the time to work out and watch Game of Thrones and all the other stuff. I couldn't think of anything else because I'm so on Game of Thrones right now. There's like one episode left and my brain's stuck. Okay. So the friends spend time on it and they don't spend time on this and therefore it's justified. So here's why. Remember I told you guys earlier it's biology? And once you know this, you can not only help reprogram yourselves, but you can also help reprogram the members or the prospects that come to you and the members as well. So there are these things called mirror neurons. It's a real thing. Google it, it's interesting as hell. And basically what it is, it's, it's been created in your mind because we are tribe people, we are pack people. And so in order for us to survive in civilization, we needed to look like our people, talk like our people, dress like our people, think like our people, believe like our people. Because if we didn't, then we'd either be outcasted or we'd be killed or something like that, right? And so that was, this, you gotta remember, like civilization the way we know it is pretty damn, like this much of a window of time. We've been building up a long time before this. And so what happens is it's mirror neurons, you can't even prevent it. So if you say, and, and I've had this in my life recently, very recently, uh, you've had this in your life where you can say, I can hang out with my friends, I'm not gonna become them. You cannot help it. Biologically, you can, it's like saying, I can hang out with guys that got pink eye and rub my face on them, I won't get pink eye. Yes, you will, I don't care what you're thinking. You will get pink eye, that will happen. And you will get programmed to think like these negative people or think like whatever people you hang out with. That's why this is so important. That's why I wanted to create this. It was beautiful to watch Daniel, um, just like a month ago, at a uh, studio. They were at GSDCon. They were, they were hanging out in New York. They met up. It's beautiful to watch Brittany post on Facebook Hey, I'm here. Who else is going to GSCCon? I mean, Kim and a bunch of other people said, yeah, come to my studio, come to my studio. And, and that's what it's about. You want to learn and hang out with people that are investing the time and money like you all have to be here and learn how to be better entrepreneurs. You do not want to spend all your time outside of this circle because if you do, you'll think more like the outside of the circle. I created this because this changed my life. And I'm not even kidding with you on that. The people that I get to network with now have changed my perception of what I'm capable of doing, what my limits actually are, and also what I believe my limits are for the people that I'm talking to. Uh, for those of you at the panel, we talked about that with like even my team. And when I hear my team say, I can't do that, or I'm not a morning person, I know what they're saying. What they're saying is you're programmed to think it's okay to say I'm not a morning person because your friends say it, now you can say it, and now you're fine. But now guess what? That girl has lost 40 pounds, and she's literally waking up at 5 a.m. to go do her workout before work every day for like months. Just by asking a question, is that the story you're telling yourself? Right? As a salesperson, your job is to help them reprogram their terrible programming that they've already got installed. The challenge, the challenge is what I learned from Grant Cardone right here. And I want you guys to hear this. And this is a lot of salespeople suffer from this, this concept. Are these mine or yours? Those are not mine. Okay. So, I don't know so you know, you go to a store and you see the Persols for 300 and you're like, those aren't worth 300. Do you're right. What you're really saying though, what you're really saying is, and a, problem, a reason why a lot of salespeople can't sell their own products, is they think 300 bucks is a lot of money. I know, because I was brought up like this. I was brought up to believe the best deal was the cheaper price. I'm gonna lose them anyway. I'm gonna scratch them, so why not just get some for 15? That's your parents training you. Right. Rather than your parents saying, hey, there's unlimited amounts of money here. You're not paying for these sunglasses. Somebody else is. All I gotta do is get Mike to buy a product from me and I can buy and lose and scratch as many of these pairs as I want as long as I can keep replacing that, right? So, um, It's not about the glasses being worth 300, it's about you being worth 300. I'm worth 300. Right. Because this is just made up. 
These aren't worth $30. They're not worth $3. They're not worth anything until you want to look all cool, you know? And then you're like, dang, man. And, and you get one compliment, man. Those shades look good on you, man, right? So, so it's like, yeah, they're not worth $300. Right. I agree with that. But here's the problem. If you're selling for souls and you won't pay $300, mm -hmm. you'll never sell them for $300. Right. So I want to tell you, tell you something interesting. I've had... I'll tell you a story about four salespeople, and I'm only going to use the names of the two good ones, and I'm going to leave out the names of the two that didn't work out well at my company. Okay, I'm going to bring up four of them. Okay, one of them was Molly Callop, and the other one was Melanie Daly. Okay, the other two, I'll start with without mentioning their names. These two here, they do not invest in themselves ever. Ever. In fact, if I even told them to get a weekend course in sales for like 99 bucks, they'd wonder why I won't pay it. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I pay it. I pay a bunch of money. I pay $31,000 for a three-year program for my team that has sales training. But the point is, their first instinct is, well, you're the one that's getting the benefit. No, I'm not. If you quit, that goes with you. That stays in your head. I invested in stuff before I was a business owner, when I was working for people. Because in my head, that stays in my head. And it's gone for you. These people never invested in anything. They got the cheapest version of everything. They negotiated with everything. They questioned price on everything. It was always that. That was their conversation. Molly, she had what's, what was called maintenance, Molly maintenance. She had her hair. She got to go into the best hair salons. She wanted to get the best tanning. She had the best clothes. She wanted to really take care of herself. And she spent a good amount of money on that stuff. And she would go to retreats where she'd be able to like relax and enjoy herself. And you know what? Molly had no problem ever asking somebody for 1500 bucks. She just actually couldn't even understand why you wouldn't do it. Like, what are you talking about? Melanie, our salesperson right now, who just broke two and a half sales records, before working for me, she was an entrepreneur. She was making $30,000 a month. Hey, GSD Show fans. I just wanted to make a clarification as I made a speaker error on stage. Melanie was not making $30,000 a month. She was making $30,000 a year. Very big difference. Wanted to clarify, and let's get back to the talk. When I first met her, she called me up, saw an ad, and she said, hey, I actually want you to coach me. And I said, okay, and she said, what does that look like? And I said, it's $5,000 down, $2,500 a month. And she goes, that's a lot. And I said, I know, but that was a deal. We talked about it, I don't know, like the next day she signed up. The goal was to get her to $80,000. She hit $80,000 within that year. She ended up wanting to join forces, which we did, and she's making more than twice that as a sales rep here at our company. But let me tell you why Melanie has no problem asking you, or you, or you, or you for $1,500 or $2,500 a month, because she paid it. So for her, it's like, yeah, you invest that in yourself. What do you mean? Like, do you want to make money? Well then, invest money into things that make you money or else you're not gonna have the thing that makes you money. You're gonna have what you already have, and if you have what you already have, you're gonna keep getting what you already got. I don't, she doesn't get it. She can't wrap her head around it. And now, especially that she saw that 30 turn to 80 in less than a year, and now that she signs people up and she sees what it's doing for them, it's easier. For you, how many of your employees, or do you even as studio owners, have a membership at another studio that costs about the same? Now you would say, well, why would I work out anywhere else but mine? Come on. You can work out at yours three times a week, but work out at some other place at least once or twice. Check it out. Learn. It's a great networking tool anyway. But get another membership where you're spending more than what you're charging. And, I pro and, your, and your employees. And make, convince them to pay for it. It's going to be tricky. That's part of your sale. you got to sell them, right? But when they start investing in themselves, and when you start investing in yourself more than you're asking your people to invest for the same thing, it's easier to ask for that money because you're programmed different now. But what happens is your mirror neurons are going to be picked up by them and the people that don't spend money the way they ask other people to spend money are not going to spend, they, they just, it, it's biology. You may think the lead sucks, it's biology. It's happening. Like we just, it just, it's really weird the way things work. Is it okay if I get weird on one thing here? This is something I learned and it was like this weird documentary but it was pretty crazy. I'm going to get a little weird for like two minutes. Is that okay? I'll come right back. But just to show you how biology works and like just being by vicinity. So ladies, when it's your time of the month and you hang out with like five other girls, like what happens? 
everyone gets in sync, right? And you know like how that works? Does anybody ever question how that works? Here's how it works. I found this out. I thought it was the most amazing piece of information I ever had. I can't use it personally, but I thought it was amazing. The way it works is there's an alpha female that everyone syncs to. So whoever you, if you went off the clock, you weren't the alpha in that group. If you remain consistent, everyone syncs to you, the alpha. Why? Because evolution wanted the strong, the fittest to survive, the strongest to survive, the alphas. That's a better chance for our race to survive, right? And so if I'm off the market, all of you are off the market. So you're sinking to me because you're not going to get that guy. That guy needs to come to me. The alpha needs to be attracted to me. But if I'm off the market, go to him. I thought that was insane. The fact that that's how we can literally like our bodies talk to each other without us doing anything. And the same thing happens with mirror neurons. You start saying dude, other people start saying dude. You feel sad, all of a sudden energy, right? Energy contagious, culture, bad in the company. Like it's just weird how it all picks up. And so I want you guys to think like, hey, if I want my mirror neurons to set off something where people react well to me, how do I program myself to be the person that gets reflected into that person? Is your perception of advertising programmed and how you spend money in advertising, right? So now I've been able to hang out with people like Russell Brunson, Cameron Harold, Vince Reed, Billie Jean. Billie Jean's going to be speaking tomorrow. These guys have been telling me to advertise forever. And in, in a way that I haven't been advertising. I've always advertised, but in the, I always spent like maybe five to, to like $15,000 a month in advertising. And in the last three months, I spent like $65,000. And we broke two and a half sales records. And I went to Billy's house and I said, hey man, we just broke two and a half sales records. And he goes, what do you think you did differently? I go, I spent a bunch of advertising. He goes, yeah, well, how long am I telling you that? I said, a long time. He goes, thanks for the birthday gift. Who spends, so, Raise your hand if you spend most of your time, out of all the people you have, raise your hand if you spend most of your time with people that spend a really good amount of money on advertising. Look at the room, look around. Now raise your hand if you believe you spend a good amount of money in advertising. Look around. A little different, that guy in the back, awesome. How much, Zach, I know you do. How much money do you spend on advertising every month? How much? 200 a day, 200 a day. So right there, he's spending $6,000 a month. That's a healthy budget. That's a very healthy budget, right? Who has at least one full-time employee right now? Okay, you over there in the back red. What's up, man? No, you, Justin, right? Justin? Yeah, how, mu how much do you pay, pay that employee, roughly? Uh, 36 a year. 36 a year, so that's 3,000 3, a month? 3,000 a month? Okay, so $3,000 a month. Now, what are your expectations of that employee when it comes to how much money do you expect them to make you at the end of the year? You haven't even thought about it. Okay, but what would, what would you say would be fair? What would be that return that you want? At least double that, right? So, do you know if you don't even know if you're getting it though? So, Programming, right? We see other people pay this money for employees, so we feel like, yeah, that's okay, it's justified. We should pay this for employees. We should pay this. But advertising, I don't know anybody that pays, so that's the cycle, right? So what's more expensive than advertising? Obscurity is one thing I learned from him. Obscurity, not being known. If people don't know you, they can't buy you. The example I gave at the uh, lunch in the panel was if I wanted to date a girl, if I wanted to be able to get dates, and I went out to every club I can go to, every bar I can go to, every party I can go to, every day, every night, as many as I can, my chances are way, way higher than if I sit at home by myself in my room playing Xbox. Would you agree? Because if the girls don't know me, are my odds good? Now if I go here, the odds are good. If I'm everywhere all the time, are my odds much, much better? Yeah, my clientele rises. So same thing goes for the business and advertising, right? You want to be everywhere all, all the time. The opposite of obscurity is omnipresence. If you started a company, it's your obligation to your employees and to your clients to grow. Here's why. Employees, raise your hand. Anybody that's an employee in the room. Okay, what's your name? Sandy. Sandy. I'm not going to ask you how much money you make, but I will ask, would you want to be making more money in a year from now? Would you expect to be making more money in a year from now? How about two years from now? How about three years from now? Mathematically, that can't happen unless the company grows. Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? 
So in order for your employees to get what they want, which is earn more, grow in their careers, the company in which they work in have to earn more and grow as well. It is your job, it's your obligation to grow this business. You can't not do it. And that means doing the things that make you uncomfortable just like you want your members to do. As uncomfortable as you want them to get for the level of success that they want to achieve is as uncomfortable as you have to get for the level of success that you want to achieve. Maybe greater. The more people that know you and the better they know you, the more likely they'll buy with less information. So I'm going to show you this clip. So this is the conversation I was having with Bob. We were just on the phone talking, or Zoom talking, and I want you to listen to how funny, how crazy this is when you realize like, how important it is just to be known. We don't know if Nike is actually better than the other stuff. We just see it so much that we go in this store, we feel comfortable going to Nike, right? Like as, no, no one, you've not done the research on all the other sneakers. I haven't, this guy hasn't, you haven't. You haven't been like, let me see the, the soul of this. What's the quality of the soul? No, it's I, I, the quality of how well I know this brand is what I'm gonna buy off of. That's it, the way the sneaker works. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, Nike shoes are, actually suck, so. I know, I know it. And I, I have them on right now, actually, so I can't believe I'm saying that, but they, their workout shoes are not that great. So that, what, what does that teach you? Think about this. You know how people say, like, no like trust? No is the strongest one. Isn't that crazy? Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean don't get people to like it and don't get people to trust you. And that certainly doesn't mean don't be great at what you do. Because being great at what you do and delivering an excellent experience and going the extra mile after going the extra mile to your members will amplify the hell out of being known, okay? But you gotta be known. People gotta know you. And I have to go, I, I advertise to people that are in US, Australia, I've got clients in Hong Kong, in Canada. You guys have a five mile radius. Five miles to just crush, to just saturate, to just drench in what your business is over and over and oh five miles six months of commitment you won't walk it you won't be able to walk into a whole foods without people knowing your shirt and going i see you guys I, you can't five miles it's too easy the problem is we see it as so hard but like how you look at fitness right if i was a person that doesn't understand fitness and i'm just a little out of shape and i'm unhealthy and i want to lose 25 pounds you'd say Mike, do you have any knee problems or back problems or any like weird health concerns I don't know about? No, no, everything's fine. I just can't get the weight off. It seems like I can never do it. You'd be like, do you have any weird allergies I need to know about? No, I can lose six months. We get this done, maybe five, depending on your commitment level. No, it can't happen, Kevin. You know it can happen because you guys are fitness professionals. You understand the math and the science and it's just common sense. It's math, right? How many of you guys can get a normal, healthy person to lose 25 pounds inside of six months? Raise your hands high. That's how easy it is, I is for, to see, like, just commitment, like real hardcore commitment. Going six months, everyone in this five mile radius will know exactly who I am. Everyone. So McDonald's, Kleenex, Bank of America, Kia, all these brands really focused on the no. Kia was really cool the way they came out of nowhere, where Blake Griffin jumped over a car in the slam dunk competition. Now. The conversation the next day was, did you see Blake Griffin jumped over a car? What do you think the first question was? What's that? What kind of car? It's a Kia. Great. So what happens is he thought about the marketing. He thought, he thought differently. He's not copying everyone. Because sometimes when you copy off the kids in class, you don't even know if they studied. That's terrible. If I'm going to copy off the kid, I know this guy did his work. <laughs> You know, but I'm not going to copy off kids. I don't know. Sometimes we're copying. It's like they look like a successful gym. But how many people, how many, how many of you guys would say that on the surface, there was a point where you looked like you had a successful gym to your friends and family, but you were dying inside. That company you're co copying might be dying inside. So I want, want you to do more thinking on that kind of stuff. This is a great one by Old, Old Spice. I remember in high school making fun of Old Spice when some kid brought in Old Spice. I was like, what the hell is that? Because it sounds like old man deodorant. Like, now that you, like, you have the name program in your head to be normal, but like, think of the name Old Spice if you never heard that name before. It's, what a weird name. This guy comes out of nowhere and starts hitting them with a series of these. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. 
Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using Lady Scented Body Wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. I have it. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamonds. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. <laughs> Just weird, right? So Frank was talking about weird. Like, that's weird, but weird gets attention. Right? You want to be really good at getting attention as well. And sometimes attention doesn't necessarily have to come in weird forms like that. Um, again, the speaker tomorrow, Hermosi, he gets attention by really talking about like, the results he gets for his gyms that he works with, right? And like all that stuff. I've used that as well. I'll do a combination of different things. We'll use crazy videos like that. But would you guys agree that this and the show that I did this morning, that's kind of weird and crazy and gets attention? Did I have your attention at 9.01? The GSD show, the way that we've done that, and tomorrow, I can't wait for you to see what we're doing. Uh, but the way we did the GSD show and the GOAT show and all these things, right, those are done to get attention. So the cool thing is, you know, Alex has his style. I think it's great, and it definitely works. And I could have copied him and maybe got somewhat far, but I want to do my own thing. I want to pave my own way, and I want to do what I want to do. And all I have to do is stop and think. And when you look at what I'm doing here, this hasn't really been done in the fitness studio industry, but I'm just copying what's done in the marketing and advertising industry. Same thing with the GSD show. If you guys, how many of you guys watch a GSD show? Yeah, good, good. So GSD show, it's sports center, but it's not done in a podcast format. Sometimes to be innovative in your own space doesn't mean you have to copy someone in your space or create, create something totally new. You can take things that are working really well in another industry separate and find a way to plug it into what you're doing, and now you're the only one doing it in your space. So I went, I went to this place called Flywheel. And when I went to Flywheel, it was really cool. It was the one right in, uh, I don't know, down uh, by, by the Scottsdale Quarter or whatever it is. And I'm in there, and I go up and I start riding this bike, and, the, and I see all the stats, and I know where I'm ranked, and I get off and I get like a 260 or something, and the girl, the girl says, uh, yeah, it was really good. I go, what's like the best? She's like, I mean, high fours, fives. How many people have ever gotten 500? She goes like six. I'm like, really? How many riders have come in here? It's like thousands. And so my brain instantly went 72 ounce steak, right? You know, you know that where you go, they have restaurants? If you eat the 72 ounce steak, what happens? You get the steak for free, you get a t-shirt, and you go up on the wall. I was like, why don't you do anyone, like six out of thousands? Yeah. Say, hey, advertise that. Anybody that can hit 500 will be able to, only six have done it. Anybody that does it will get a free ride for the entire month. We'll put your name on the wall and we'll give you a t-shirt you can wear to class every time to come and brag about it. Would that be cool? I'm a competitive guy. I'd hit that bike. How many of you guys would hit that bike to see how close you get to five at least? That's cool, right? But like that's taking the 72 on steak that's restaurant and here. Oh, but Mike, I don't know. I don't want people killing themselves on the bike. No, you make them sign the waiver like you do for the steak. You shouldn't eat 72 pounds of meat either. And you could die, but like you sign the waiver and it's all right. This is a question, how much should I spend in advertising every month? And this is a flawed like, way of thinking that a lot of people do it. So what they generally do is they go, okay, right now I'm comfortable with $2,000 a month or $1,500 a month or whatever it is. Anything outside of that, I, I'm like extremely uncomfortable. I have to dip into something. Okay, but this you're comfortable. Okay, so let's break it down. Let's say your revenue is only $10,000 a month. You're small, just getting started, $10,000 a month. You have, five, you have 50 clients that are each paying you $200 a month. That's where that $10,000 came from. And you go, okay, Mike, right now, $500, that's all I got. I can't spend more than five. Anything outside of five, I'm like really, really, really uncomfortable. This is really uncomfortable, but I'd be really, really uncomfortable. Okay, great. So let's say you spend that $500, bucks, and then you get 60 clients. How much, how much revenue do you have right now? $12,000 a month. Are you less comfortable or more comfortable with $500 a month than spend now? More comfortable, right? $500 is a lot less. Why wouldn't you uh, spend $2,500 right now? If you were okay with the discomfort of here, why wouldn't you put yourself back in the same discomfort and now get 5X? So now let's say you get to 100 clients and now your revenue is at $20,000 a month. Why wouldn't you spend 10 5 you don't even have to. You can just go to five, ten. That's a great budget. Like I said, six is great. 
So now, let me show you what I mean in your world. Okay, so let's say right now I could bench 185 pounds. Okay, that's it. I can only do two reps of 185. Outside of that, like I'm afraid this thing will crush my chest. A couple months later, I'm doing eight reps of 185. What's the time to do? What's the time for now? What do I do now? Who said that? Raise the weight. Why not? Why not just stay at 185? It's been working. Why not just stay? I can lift more now. 200 feels like 185 did. That same discomfort, I can, I can be here. So just keep pushing it. Keep living in that discomfort until you have the body that you want. Keep spending more. Keep living in the discomfort of whatever your budget felt like to you until you're at where you want to be in your business. But why stay the same? If you got more members in this month, spend more. Put it in your business. Even if you just take 50% of your profits and put it back in your business, do that. Because you can either pace to goal or you can race to goal. You do one of two things. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be where I could be in five years and one year. Raise your hand if you'd rather hit the five-year goal in one. Okay. So then start moving up. Lift more weight in your ad budget as you get stronger. As you add revenue, you get stronger. Take that extra strength and move up the weight. You get what I'm saying? So what type of advertising should I be doing? So there's three types of traffic you guys should be aware about. Number one is paid traffic. That's stuff a lot of people know about. It's Facebook ads, Instagram ads, YouTube ads. We're going to be talking about Facebook in the, in the VIP training tomorrow morning, 7, uh, 745, I think. Uh, YouTube ads. YouTube ads are great. I'm in love with YouTube ads. Uh, this is where you can do in-stream ads where you interrupt the video that they came there to watch. They have to watch five seconds. They have to. And if they watch up to 29 seconds and skip, you don't pay for it. You only pay if they watch 30 seconds of your ad or longer or if they click. That means you get free advertising. Most people don't click. You probably realize you don't either. Therefore, you just get branded in front of people for free all day long. And because Facebook is pretty much, so the way it works, like AdWords did, AdWords used to get five cent clicks. Then it went to a dollar and five dollars and eight dollars and it goes up from there. I literally have worked with industries that was like $150 per click. That was the restoration industry, okay? Then it got so high, they moved on to Facebook. People waited till then, they got into Facebook. Now Facebook, it used to be like, same thing, very, very, very cheap per lead, then it went up, then it went up, and it's going up. The reason is because there isn't enough ad supply as there is for the demand from advertisers. They are out, and now it's a bidding game. YouTube, 70% of the ad space on YouTube remains unsold. So they're giving the shit away. They're giving it away. You're getting in front of people visually, in video, for free, 90% of the time. And what you do pay for, on average, we see sometimes as low as five cents per true view, meaning they watch 30 seconds of your video for five cents. Overall, with the people that watched 30 seconds or longer and everyone below that, just they see me for somewhere range of one second or five seconds to whatever, We've paid as low as 70% of one penny per view. Does that blow your mind? Think about like, hey man, give me a penny so I can get like a really good prospect to see your business. No, 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 hold on here, take this part back. I just need this part of the penny. That's it, 70% of one penny and I get you that view. How many of you guys are like saying, I should really look at YouTube? <laughs> it's crazy, it's really, really good. Okay, and then you could do display stuff too, right? So if somebody's searching like weight loss and let's say they're within five miles of your studio and they're a female, that's between 25 and 50. Anybody that's searched weight loss, now your ad can pop up because you know that's what they're at. That's mentally where they're at right now. Or it, right now the big trend, this is like a real trend right now, like booty gains or like butt gains or what, what, I don't know what the hashtags are, but like there's like things that girls are doing to find like unlimited butt exercises on Instagram. Like there's like 1,800 exercises apparently you could do to, to boost your, your butt. On top of that, there's Google Ads, there's Snapchat, 
there's ways. Ways is unbelievable. Unbelievable. I couldn't even believe it when I saw I almost didn't even do it because it seemed like such a reach. But Waze is great. Waze is the number one navigation app in the entire world. And you can literally get guaranteed 30,000 impressions, meaning when somebody's using the app to navigate and they get within a certain range of your studio, as long as they're driving in the direction of your studio, so like within two miles or something, your ad would pop up. So like free week here, come today, or you know, free class today, come now. It'll pop up. 30,000 impressions for an average of $65. One campaign that we saw recently, we were just checking it out because I wanted to get like a case study together. This guy had like 145 visits to the website and had 119 navigations to the studio. And there was 10 people that the studio owner can claim and say, yeah, they came in just saying they were going somewhere and then they just found me on Waze and then just took them here. They rerouted. 10. Cost $64, I think is what she spent. $6.40, not for a lead, not for a book, for a show. Earned traffic is the next type of traffic, okay? So earned traffic is like what I do with podcasts. How many of you guys have a podcast? Anybody have a podcast? It's really good. Works really well. Um, I mean, I, I can vouch for it. Works really well for us. It's not only great to attract more people, but what a great resource for the people that are already trusting you. To be able to tell your members, hey, every week I'm going to be uploading more information on how you can lose fat or get in shape here in Irvine, right? Here are new mountains or here's great restaurants. Here are the, if you're going to eat fast food, here on this episode, if you're going to eat fast food, where in Irvine, California, right? And now you can just go, hey, I checked out a bunch of places. Here's a great place. Now, before you dive in crazy, here's what I will say. Not all of you guys should be creating podcasts, okay? But if you, if you know that you can like, have a conversation, you captivate people when you talk to people, like if people have said to you, like, man, I can listen to you, or yeah, I really get that, I didn't think of it. Like if you can really see like, the mind shifts when you talk to people, then you've got something that can be developed. But if you don't have that, like do your own game, right? Maybe it's just ads and get really good at sales and build a good sales team. Okay, but if you've got that unique capability, which I, I have, I think, I believe I have it, and I've worked on strengthening it, where I feel like I can deliver a message and I can, I can like get you to see what I see sometimes, then I wanted to use that unique capability so that I can make it work for me better. And so for you, podcast might be the thing. Blogs is another thing. Maybe you're really great at writing. I am not, right? Um, speaking, this could be another thing. And it doesn't have to be like this. It could literally be going to the chiropractor. Hey. I'd love to actually do a presentation for you guys on this. Now, how do you get that chiropractor? There's a really great book called The Pumpkin Plan. I definitely recommend you watch it or watch the episode where Mike McAllister is on my podcast. He's the author of Pumpkin Plan. Basically, what he said is, I go to you. You're my member, right? And I say, hey, you know, you're really great. I, I just want to let you know. Like, I pull him aside. Hey, I just want to let you know you've been great here. You've been doing everything I want you to do. You work your butt off. You're actually setting a really good example of the class. Uh, I, I know you're going to get to your goal, but I just want to ask, like, I want to find a way that I can get there better. What else are you doing outside of this? Like, are you doing cryo? Are you going to chiropractors? Are you doing acupuncture? Are you getting massages? What else are you doing? Yeah, I got a chiropractor I go to, and yeah, I'll do cryo once, like, a couple weeks or something like that. Really? Is it working for you? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Do me a favor. I want to make it work better for you. What's your chiropractor? I'm going to call. I want to call him. I want to let him know what we're doing here. And this way we can talk and maybe we can find out a way that like his program can work really well with our program. Is that cool? Would you like me to do that? I'd love to chat with him. Yeah, that'd be great. Now I call this guy up. Hey, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Hey, uh, I, I, you know Lance Caballero? He's one of your clients. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know Lance. Hey, listen, I was talking to him. He's really serious about his goal right now. And uh, he and I were talking. He thinks it's a good idea for you and I maybe to get together and talk about what he's working on. He really wants to elevate it. Um, I, he's one of my favorite clients, so I couldn't say no to him. What do you think? You want to get together? Can he say no to that? What if he does? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just tell Lance you can't, you can't do it. <laughs> he's going to make that meeting, right? Now, here's the thing. If Lance is an ideal client and he's got him, is there a good chance that he's attracted more of my potential ideal clients? So I want to be in front of this guy. I want to be in front of anyone that has attracted my ideal clients. And I want to stay connected to them because they might have 
bit of magnet to other people that I haven't gotten yet. And then I want to be able to develop a relationship and maybe invite him to come speak. Hey, man, my members, they're putting a lot of strain on themselves. And I know preventative stuff's really good. Can you come over here and can you actually, you know, do a talk for my members and kind of show them what you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ever need me for anything, I'd love to do it. Actually, actually, and have a pitch. I can show them, like, the best place they can eat in Springfield or this or whatever, right? Have a, have a pitch lined up. And then you can go down there and you can present to his company, right? Speaking is another good way to do it. Press, which uh, Felicia Romero is going to be talking about tomorrow, which is great. She's going to talk about how to get on TV four to six times a month. And I think you're dipping into a bunch of other stuff too. Look, cool stuff. And then also, well, local TV, like we talked about, just kind of plays the same game. And then SEO, which right now I feel like it's more work than it's worth. So unless you're really good at it or you know a guy that can do it really well for cheap, I wouldn't pay him. There's so many other things that you could be doing right now. And keep in mind, that's coming from a guy that did SEO for six years. I know SEO. I just don't think it's the same anymore for local. Own traffic, this is the next tier. So we had paid traffic, we had earned traffic, and now we have owned traffic. So now that I have paid traffic that brought people to me, I have own, uh, earned traffic that brought people to me, now I own your phone number. It's now here in my database. I now own your number that I can text you at. I now own your email address that I can keep emailing you. I now own the pixel that you've now allowed me to attach myself to so I can keep running ads to you. I now own the fact that we're connected on Messenger so that now I can I continue to message you automatically through chat bots if I wanted to. I now own you as a customer, and I can continue selling to you as an existing customer or getting referral business from you. How many of you guys get a lot of good referral business? Yep. So that's good. That's a lead gen then, right? Would you agree that a customer is a lead gen? Yep. When it comes to internet leads, this is something that's very important to know. I talked a little bit about this at the lunch panel, but you have to have really good expectations. Steph Curry's the best shooter in, in the game right now and potentially in history, and he only makes 50% of his shots. But he can be excited and happy about it because he knows what the rest of the world's doing. He knows the game and the metrics and the numbers. He knows 50's top. Therefore, when he shoots 55, he's pumped about it. So what I notice is a lot of people that we'll work with or that I talk to, they don't really do internet advertising. They really haven't done it at a high level. They've gotten most of their leads from referrals or walk-ins. And what happens is these close at such a high rate that it messes you up. It's almost like Steph Curry comparing layups to three-pointers and going, oh man, I make like nine or 10 out of 10 layups. And now you want me to shoot these threes and dude, I'm only making four or five out of 10. Why would I do it? Steph Curry doesn't have that conversation because he knows what a good three-point percentage is. So when it comes to internet leads, your percentage is going to be the average that we see out of 1,400 studios. The average is right around 10% conversion rate. Average. Now, we have studios that, like Daniel. Daniel, what, what's your conversion rate? 23%. Are you happy with that? Thumbs up if you are. <laughs> So 20%, so 80%, right? 80% show rate or book rate versus a 23% close rate. When you talk about 80% just getting them booked, your expectations based on referral leads, you'd be like, dude, I'm cl I close 90%. I can't even get 80% to show. It's a different thing, right? Now here's a cool thing as I go on. You got phrases, oh, the leads are weak, the leads aren't quality, these people aren't serious when I call them, these people don't have money, they never answer the phone, I can't tell when they call, they're not a good fit. Like these are the phrases that we hear from people that really are like advertising for the first time online. People like Daniel, people like Brittany, um, people like Eric, well Eric just knows how to sell the hell out of people, but like people that like have done this for a while, they, they don't say this. But what happens is when you're, not closing 80, 90% of your leads, you think there's a problem with the leads, or if you're at least somewhat accountable, there's a problem with you. In reality, that's a good ratio. And I'll tell you why. The leads are weaker. You're 100% right, they are weak. But what do you all do for a living? So, I know you. Sir, what's your name? James, James, what do you do for a living? Strength and conditioning, this works perfect for my example. Okay, so getting a person that's already physically fit to work out at your gym and then take credit for it, does that make you a good trainer? 
Like, let's say I came in ripped, shredded. You had nothing to do with it. And I come in, and I'm like, hey, man, can I just work out at your place? I want to get a membership? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just work out. You say, man, I look the same 30 days later, and you do like a picture and say, here's my client. Does that make you a good trainer? No. It makes you a property owner that you just allowed me to work out in, right? Getting a strong lead to buy from you doesn't mean you're a good salesperson. It just means you're an order taker. Sometimes we only want the layups, right? We're like, oh, I want a person that already has money and they want to get in shape. The person that already has money and wanted to get in shape got in shape already. Who here says, who here, right, forget being humble for a second, just we use a good example. Raise your hand if you believe you make good money. Like you make good money. You would qualify that compared to yourself five years ago, you say, I make good money today. Okay, you make good money? If you want something that's within a few hundred bucks, like are you saving up for it at this point or are you just gonna go get it? Okay. So people that have money, people that make 70, 90, 80K that everyone's asking for, that want a gym membership, they're not scrolling and waiting. Man, I just can't wait for a deal. I hope an offer hits me. They're not saying that. We need to sell to people. We need to be good enough to learn how to sell to people that are A, in the lower income bracket, and B, may not be looking to get in shape actively. But here's the deal. Everyone wants to be in better shape subconsciously at least. Everyone. There are zero people that would go, oh my God, abs again. Like, seriously, how do I gain fat already? I got to quit this gym. Would you agree? No one ever said that. No one. Everyone wants to be in better shape. So we know that's done. And not everybody necessarily wants or needs a deal. But here's the thing. The person that doesn't have money and the person that's been wanting to get in shape but they haven't because maybe they didn't believe they could afford it, they see the ad. It hits them harder than the guy that's got money and wants to be in shape or doesn't want to be in shape. Because this person that doesn't have money, free anything is going to catch their eye. Free appetizer, free whatever. And then, week at a, mem- at a fitness studio. Oh, it's what I've been wanting. Oh, but Mike, I don't want tire kickers. Look, my tires are good. Go ahead and kick them and I'll sell them to you. Kick my tires. Watch, I'll show you. Boom, those are damn good tires. I know. So if you have a good studio and you have a great sales process followed up with it, here's the thing, you have to have a great sales process. If you have a good studio, you have a great sales process, you truly care about your members, people that say they can't afford it yet have all the other stuff because their friend justified it, you can reprogram them to be able to justify this expense. Sometimes it's just as simple as asking that question. So right now, who feels they couldn't afford $1,500 a month in advertising? You. Can you come up here real quick? Not, not, like, just stand. Just stand up. Can you have a loud voice? Say yeah. yeah. Okay. So right now you feel like you couldn't spend $1,500 a month in advertising? Yeah. yeah. But if you could, how would you justify that expense? What does that mean? Okay, so, if, so you could justify finding the money and spending it if you knew you'd get an ROI. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll get you an ROI right now. So now, you want to do it? Yeah. Okay, sit down. How f- simple was that? Hey, I can't spend $150 on a membership. Really? Why not? It's just too much. But if you were able to find a way to make that money you know, work for you and get you to where you need to be, how would you justify it? If you were going to spend that money, how would you justify it? Um, how would you make sense of it? I mean, I, I want to get in shape. I know I'd be better shape. Okay. Well, if I tell you I can get you there, and I can guarantee you as long as you do what I say I, that, that works, what's stopping you now? Will you do it? I promise you you're going to get a lot of yeses. But how many of you guys have actually asked straight up that question? How many of you guys are excited to test that question? Here's what happened. You just got trained. That's it. You just literally got a minute of training, and you immediately are excited to go do some shit that you know is going to work because you watched it work. I just signed him up. Melanie, please get him a contract. 
Where is that? <laughs> you just watched it work. But why, if that's the case, why wouldn't you do it all the time? Why wouldn't you be sales training every day? Why? Does it make, like, raise your hands if now you're going, yeah, it makes no sense, Mike. I don't know why I'm not doing it every day. Nobody can make sense of it. Raise your hand if you feel like, yes, it makes sense to train every day in sales, even if it's just for five minutes. You learn something in one and a half, I'll give you three and a half times that. Improve your sales skills and the leads become stronger. This guy is an advertiser. He owns an ad agency called Zimmerman Advertising. His name's Jordan Zimmerman. His advertising agency does $4.4 billion a year. He works with the biggest brands you've heard of. And listen to this little quick 20, 30 second clip I have with him. Do you ever have uh, brands that you work with or have you had brands that you work with that have so much potential and you run great ads for it, all the marketing does this job, but the sales process that they have afterwards is somewhat broken or not as sophisticated? Mike, you already know the answer. I know. I'm Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, you know, great advertising to bad brands right. doesn't work. Okay, I'd rather have okay advertising to great brands. At least I know it'll work. Operationally, a brand has to be set up. A brand has to be ready for digital traffic and the conversion of that digital traffic through their BDC, their business development centers. Would you guys agree with that? I agree with them. I'm not going to tell you that internet leads are the hottest leads you can get, but here are some stats that you should know. 2% of sales are made on the first contact. You heard Brittany talk a lot about this. 3% of sales are made on the second contact. 80% of sales are made between the fifth and 12th contact. You heard me say I followed up with Daniel 26 times. He said no 25 times. Daniel has been my, one of my best clients, if not my best client. I literally moved to conference for him. He's referred me a lot of business. Sometimes you don't realize that one person you're calling 25 times, it's not just a sale that person could get you in the door to maybe 75 other memberships in their corporate center. You're not chasing the sale, you're chasing the tipping point. You're chasing that one member that can make an impact like 25 members could. You get what I'm saying? So when you're making those calls, don't be like, oh, I'm doing all this for a member. No, that would be crazy to do that. You're doing all of that for that one member, that Daniel, that Brittany, right, the Oscar, the people that literally have referred you, Joanne, the people that refer you business, the people that keep coming back, the people that will spend more with you, that believe in you. Those are the people that you're chasing. And then when you get them, you take care of them. You move a conference for them. You put them on stage. You get what I'm saying? Yes? You guys agree with that? Is that? Do you feel like you have more sense around making that call now, knowing that it's maybe I'm not just chasing a member, I'm chasing that member? You get it? Yep. 80% of salespeople admit they quit contacting before the fifth contact. So I want you to look at internet leads differently. Short game goals. Here's the way it works with lead gen when it comes to internet leads. You generate a high volume of leads. These leads are early in the funnel. That means they need to be worked and they do not close themselves. They need to be worked. They need to be worked. This is equivalent to getting a person that's very overweight. They need to be worked, okay? Now there's cold leads, there's hot leads. Hot leads come from member referrals, that's it. There's no other place a hot lead comes from. You could say, oh, it comes from, no, it's a warm lead. Hot leads are member referrals and that's it. So the goal is to get more members from cold leads so that you can gain more hot leads, right? Raise your hands if you get a lot of member referrals. Raise your hands, hi. Raise your hands if you can say that probably 50% or more of your members have come from member referrals. Stop, look at that, raise your hand. 50 a bunch of you did, 50%. Does that mean when you sign up a member, it's like signing up 1.5 members at least? Right, you gotta look at the math on that. If every, if, if, 50% of your members came from member referrals, you can assume that every member's worth one and a half, at least. So you want hot leads? Let's get them. Here's how we get them. Let's get as many cold leads as we can. Let's convert as many of those, even if it's at a small percentage, to become members. And I promise you, if you have 150 members versus 600 
members, you will get more hot leads here than you will here. We may have paid to get here, but it's worth it. How many of you guys would love to just get a bunch of hot leads all the time? Raise your hands. Is it worth getting just hot leads all the time? Then pay to get there. It's worth it. That's what we, that's what we do. Long game. Cold leads come from internet offer ads. Hot leads come from member referrals. Warm leads come from familiarity and trust. Here's the cool thing. When you run ads at all, you're always at least getting the impressions, right? And that's where it comes from. Consistent impression. Staying in front of people all the time on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, everywhere. Even if you break even or lose a little ROI in the beginning, that's okay. And that's something that a lot of people have a hard time with, right? Because we eat in fitness, right? It's like if I work out for a month, I should see some changes, right? At least, right? So it comes from these consistent impressions. Even if you break even or lose ROI a little bit in the beginning, it's okay because you're building five very important lists along the way that most organizations and larger companies, they pay for these lists that you would be getting for free or either very cheap. Your chatbot list, your text list, your phone list, your email list, your retargeting list. I'll tell you right now, if somebody comes up to me and says, Mike, I've got a retargeting list that I can share with you that's got 50,000 fitness studio owners on it. I would give them 50 grand for that list. I'd give them 50 grand. You mean I can now, from now on, run ads solely to fitness studios without having to worry about going off track and showing my ads to people that are not fitness studio owners by any chance? Yes. Yeah, here's 50 grand. I'll, I'll go into I'll figure it out. You get what I'm saying? You, but when you're running ads, as long, even if you're just breaking even, which by the way, if you're good at sales and you have a process and you're following it, you should not break even in today's world. 2019, the way advertising is, it's so freaking cheap and available and accessible, you should not be breaking even. But maybe your sales game isn't there yet, and you are while you're developing your sales game. Man, even if you break even, that means you're getting all this for free. Where people pay for it. Stay in front of them until they're ready to buy. Your fitness professionals. Fitness is a part of your routine. This is the rest of the world. If everybody was like you, there wouldn't be that many weird colors on there. It'd probably all just be whatever the good color is. What is that, turquoise? I don't even think turquoise is on the map. But if everyone was like you guys, the whole map would be turquoise. But the rest of the world is not like you, and that's the problem. Sometimes we forget that. We forget that they're not as into fitness as you are. So there's a different way you've got to come at them and sell them. You're ready for leads to buy now, but it's about when they're ready to buy, right? So we talked about Nike. Nike always runs branding ads. You always see them, whether it's Venus Williams or you got LeBron James or even Jordan still doing stuff. They're always ready to sell you sneakers. Right now, if all of you pulled out your phones right now, went to Nike.com and bought the sneaker of the day, they will be able to sell it to you. They will fulfill that order. Okay, they're always ready, but they understand that you may not need or want new sneakers right now. So they'll stay in front of you until then. And then when you finally go into the Nike store, you're the obvious choice, which raise your hands if you agree, Nike is probably the brand that if most people walked into the store and wanted sneakers, they'd really just gravitate right to the Nike section before they looked at the second options. Raise your hand if you agree that Nike is usually the first go-to. The goal is to be well-known in your area. The obvious choice when someone's ready to buy. Guys, it's five miles. It's easy. It's easy. Okay? So we started off with The Greatest Showman. I'm going to kind of take us home with this in a cool way. Okay? And I'm not going to dress up. I'm not going to put on some weird stuff. And there's not going to be people that are 10 feet tall coming out. But we're just going to kind of talk about this in a second. Yes, he's The Greatest Showman. But I love learning from this guy because he's also the greatest advertiser. What made him a great advertiser was not that he copied. What made him a great advertiser was that he spent a lot of money on what worked. And aside from that, he would constantly think. He would spend time to think and think about what would get people's attention. What would make people curious, right? So I'll give you an example. He had a museum. He wanted people to come to this museum. Tickets were a little lower than usual, even though he had some really cool stuff. So he said, I have to get something that's almost unbelievable. And he looked and he couldn't necessarily find it, so he made it up. What he said is, come to our museum to see the man eating chicken. It's amazing. It's crazy. And people lined up and everyone came in from even out of town to climb up and see this crazy man eating chicken. And they went through the museum, which they had to go to because it was the last thing. And finally, when they got to the end, what did they see? A man eating chicken. 
That was literally what was there waiting. It was a man eating chicken. They loved it. They thought it was hilarious. And they saw cool stuff along the way. And they, and they tricked their friends. They said, you got to go. There's a man eating chicken. You got to go see this thing. So they started tricking their friends. And their friends were like, man eating chicken, really? It's amazing. You got to go check it out. And they'll go with them. Now there's two tickets. They open the door. They see their friends. And they're laughing. They got hoaxed, but in a fun way. And that's a thought. Another cool thing. He said, everybody come to the corner of whatever, whatever. I forget what it was. He said, come to this corner, and I'm going to literally create traffic with my mind. And he advertised it. And he sat there at 4 o'clock. Everybody was coming to see him create traffic with his mind as he sat there at the time he said he was going to do it. And people came in from all over town, and the streets were getting full. And next thing you know, nobody can get through because there was so much traffic, which he created with his mind because he thought of that idea. Isn't that pretty cool? Would you agree he created traffic with his mind? pretty badass, right? Like I said, how, you know what that cost him to sit on the corner and just do that? And he's got a bunch of stories. There's a great book called There's a Customer Born Every Minute. I encourage every business owner to ever read it. Anybody that even wants to get somewhat better at advertising, read There's a Customer Born Every Minute. It's a great book and it digs into like not only those two stories, but also like a bunch of other really cool stuff that I think you guys would really enjoy. Um, now in a more modern era, this will be the last thing and then we'll get to head out here for the end of day one. So Richard Branson's another really good guy to study. I like studying people that are not necessarily like here all the time. I like, like, you know, the, like I love Russell Brunson and Ryan Dice and Greg Cardone and all those guys, but this guy's on another level. He's on another planet, right? And Elon Musk and, you know, Warren Buffett and those guys are just like at a different level. I really like studying these guys. So look at the way he thinks, right? He, uh, he owns Virgin Airlines and Virgin Records and all this stuff. And his biggest competitor, Virgin Airlines, was British Airways. And British Airways wanted to come up with an idea, an expensive idea. But the idea was, we're going to create the biggest Ferris wheel that ever existed, the largest Ferris wheel. And then what we're going to do is we're going to lift it up, and we're going to put it by the airport. And so when people are flying in, they'll be able to see the British Airways Ferris wheel where they may want to come down and we can make offers for the airline and vice versa. When people come to the Ferris wheel and they're up, they can see the planes flying so close right over them. Great marketing idea. Here's the problem though. They never created any type of system or machinery to lift up a Ferris wheel of this size. So for weeks, this Ferris wheel just laid on its side and they weren't able to actually lift it so they could actually use it. And it was stuck like that. They were bringing engineers, they were bringing in like techs, architects, everything, spending an obscene amount of money try, wanting to figure out how to get this thing lifted up. And so Richard Branson heard about this and he spent way less money. He got a blimp and he flew it over the Ferris wheel until they finally lifted it. And that blimp said, B.A. can't get it up. <laughs> what do you think made the paper? What do you think got attention? How, like, that's a thought. <laughs> that's just him going, like, how do, I, how do I leverage this? The most important things for you to focus on as a business owner, in my eyes, from the many mentors that I've had, and these are the things that I've took with me, and I believe that this, these to be true. Number one, make time to think. Sometimes we're so caught up in reading and listening to podcasts and going to coaches and mentors and talking to our team. Sometimes we don't just turn the radio off and just think. Turn, turn the, the book off and just think. Have your own thoughts. And some, I don't know about you. Raise your hand if you're competitive. Any competitive people? Okay, I'm more competitive, so you know. <laughs> get that? Get that? So... Um, Take the time to actually think, right? And so for me, the way that I'm able to come up with ideas even better is I think if I have a problem or if I want to create something and I can't think on my own on how to do that, I think if my competitor was going to do it, how would they do it? If my competitor was going to do this, how would they do it? If my competitor was going to solve this problem, how would they do it? And I think my competitiveness just gets me to think faster when I do that and I get more creative. I even get my team doing it, right? Like, so I've asked my team members, like, hey, can you just, oh, I don't even know how I would do that. Okay, well, if I hired somebody else to come in and work in the same position as you and they figured it out tomorrow, what would they do? All of a sudden, they're like, that, that urgency, that scarcity, oh, my God. Like, because they don't want to be the one that doesn't figure it out. 
they get creative really quickly. We're really good under pressure. How many of you guys have found out what you're capable of under pressure? And put yourself under it sometimes. Low pressure is good. Study sales, have scripts, role play. Here's why. Sales plays in everything, not just in the actual sale that we call sales, but in your marketing, your advertising, even your HR when you're wanting to recruit great, great talent, in your, in your people, keeping them, motivating them, selling them constantly on the vision and what we're here to do, on your existing customers, on what's capable for them and what's available to them and why they should do it. Everyone, sometimes to your wife, as to why I can't be home tonight. Why I've got to do this? Because I don't want to fight with her and, con and convince her. I want her to support me. But in order for her to support me, sales is not about convincing or grinding someone until they finally go, okay, fine. Sales is about finding a way to position it in a way to where the person goes, yeah, let's do it. Do you feel like, like that sales pitch I did to this gentleman over here, do you feel like I grinded him down until he finally said yes? Raise your hand if you feel like I grinded him down until he finally said yes. Raise your hands if you feel like I just changed his way of looking at it. That's sales. All I want you to do is change the way you're looking at it, because right now your programming's off. You're saying you can't, but how can you? Three, run ads all the time. There's no reason not to. No reason not to. Oh, but I'm full. Good, raise your prices. But I'm busting at the seams. People are complaining. Expand. Care about your members. This is an important one because we don't want to keep shoveling the snow while it's snowing. You want to retain. By the way, being better at sales helps you retain as well, okay? But get really great at caring about your customers. How many of you guys felt like, raise your hand if you feel like my staff cared about you today? Yeah? I asked that question blindly, but faithfully. I know my team. Okay, how many of you guys have been in the Loud Rumor office before? Yeah? How did it feel? Do they care? Yeah. What do they do when you walk in? Everybody stands up, greets you, and shakes your hand. Everyone stands up, greets you, shakes your hand. Do they give you attention? Do they, give, do they circle around you and make you feel like a star for a little bit? Feelings are what sell. Feelings. I wanted to create a feeling here for you guys so that maybe you don't remember all the content sometimes, which, by the way, you can't help but it's sticking to you. But you will remember, like, dude, that place is great. You can't even sometimes articulate it. I can't articulate, really, why I love my wife. I can't. I can give you the generic stuff. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's great with the kids. She's motivated. She's supportive. But you know what? Like, a lot of you are, too. A lot of you are beautiful and smart and funny and supportive and great with kids. So I literally describe, like, a lot of the room. I can't articulate just like a lot of you can't articulate with your partners because it's a way that she made me feel and I made her feel. There was something there subconsciously that like connected us there. And when you can start selling to the subconscious, it's very, very difficult for them to leave you. And it's very, very difficult for them not to believe in you and want to support you. And you want that from your members. Just like I want that from my clients, right? Do you guys truly believe I care about you guys? You call Len, do I answer my there for you? You guys back there, Daniel, Brittany, you believe I care about you? Raise hands if so. Truly. Yes. I've got to be able to ask that question so confidently to anyone in the room. Okay? So caring about your customers, truly important, and then growing your lifetime customer value. Number five, feed your mirror neurons good food. Stop hanging around the people that you want to outgrow. Cameron Harold is my coach right now. And... Technically, we don't qualify for his COO alliance that I invested in Rob. It's $20,000 a year to get Rob in there. $20,000 a year. He said, technically, you don't qualify. I said, why? He said, your company has to be doing at least this much in revenue in order to do it, and you guys would be like right at the bottom. You guys would just miss it. And I said, that's why I want to be in that room. That's all I needed to hear from Rob. I was like, good, good, get in that room. That's the room. Get in there. I don't want to be the smartest guy. I want to be the guy that's like, I want to pay to learn from all these guys. By the way, I'm from Jersey, so when I say guys, I mean girls and guys. Guys is, is like y'all, I guess, in some parts. So don't take offense. I mean women and men on that. And lastly, if you're going to build a Ferris wheel, make sure you get the damn thing up. Sounds good? That's my talk for today. Did you guys enjoy it?
Thanks for watching. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, or YouTube. And to watch more episodes and get exclusive links from each episode, go to gsdshow.com. Again, that's gsdshow.com.